Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski, and I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It's really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. And today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Dr. J. Nathan Matias organizes citizen behavioral science for a safer, fairer, more understanding internet. A Guatemalan American, Nathan is an assistant professor in the Cornell University Department of Communication and Information Science. Nathan leads the Citizens and Technology Lab there. Thomas Guarna, who's a graduate student at MIT and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Nathan in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latina and Latino Studies Program, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Trifayas, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Ottawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institutions history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Thomas Guarna will tell us a little bit more about Nathan's research and career in just a few seconds. Then Nathan will deliver his seminar. After that, we will open up for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of the screen at any point in time during the talk. Tomás will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Tomás, the screen is all yours. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Professor Wachowski, for introduction. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Nathan Matias, who's an assistant professor at Cornell's Department of Communication and Information Science. Before this position, he obtained his PhDs at MIT's Media Lab, where he, where he was affiliated with the Center for Civic Media and was a visiting scholar there and a research affiliate at Princeton. And Professor Matias is a scholar of civic media who channels rigorous studies of human behavior to understand key questions about the governance of the, of the digital sphere. Through his work in the Citizens and, Citizens and Technology Lab, the research lab he, research, he leads at Cornell, he has explored topics like how communities can audit algorithms, the role of automated moderators, and the motivations for volunteer moderators in online communities. Professor Matias' works, uh, works, Professor Matias's work proves how rigorous methods can be employed to answer fundamental questions about civic life and how the outcomes of complex research can serve online communities and contribute to healthier, more equitable online ecosystem. So please join me in welcoming Professor Matias. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, I should ask you to uh, present my research in the future. Uh, so it's really exciting to be able to speak to all of you today about this problem and question of an opportunity of governing runaway catastrophes in human and algorithm behavior. And I want to start in uh, Chicago in March 2017 when Wilmer Catalan Ramirez was tackled in his Chicago home by immigration agents threatened with deportation and detained. Uh, even though, and he couldn't really understand why that was the case. The agents had no warrant, he had no criminal record, and his only encounters with the police had been random stops in his neighborhood. He was also recovering from a brain injury he had experienced from a drive-by shooting in his area. Unknown to Catalan Ramirez, his name had been added to a Chicago predictive policing system 
after he was injured in this drive-by shooting. Now, this strategic subjects list, according to police, was designed to improve community support. In practice, police targeted people and communities on the list, trapping them in this cycle of escalating suspicion. Uh, Ramirez was only released from detention after 10 months of extensive legal challenges and given a piece of paper he could produce if he was targeted by the algorithm uh, again. Now, researchers writing about these kinds of systems have pointed out how these algorithms can trap uh, innocent people in escalating cycles of suspicion. You know, uh, Barocas Hard and Narayanan write, suppose a predictive policing system determines that a certain person or area is at high risk of crime, uh, the prediction will appear to be validated because of course the police visit someone or detain them and that generates more records which can then reinforce what the algorithm uh, chooses to target in the future. Here's another story. In 2014, after someone illegally broke into multiple celebrity photo accounts, people posted non-consensual intimate imagery to forums on the platform Reddit. Now, as people downloaded and reacted to these photos, Reddit's algorithms, their popularity systems, promoted them to even more people, keeping the cycle going and even earning the company more than $100,000 before the company banned the content a week later. In an article about this, Adrian Masanari describes how non-human technological agents can shape and are shaped by human activity. Now, during this dreadful episode on Reddit, a set of powerful non-human agents, including Reddit's business model, its corporate policies, its algorithms, were driving and being influenced by large groups of people. Even in a culture that already has dehumanizing views about women, encouraged by the many thousands of people who viewed and further spread this content without consent. So this problem of interrelated human and machine behavior is a deep and pervasive one. And these feedback loops have been blamed for things like mass murder, self-harm, suicide, and health misinformation, just to name a few. But even as we worry about their risks, We've seen beautiful examples of humans and algorithms that cooperate to spread generosity, grow understanding, and develop transformative citizen power. There are people who are alive and healthy today and who live in hope of a more just society thanks to the benefits of some of these uh, feedback loops as well. So, you know, if, if feedback is this straightforward mutual influence, why might we be so worried about it? Well, in any situation of mutual causality, it's difficult to blame any single part of the system and hard to know if changing a single part of the system will change uh, the overall outcomes. You know, imagine, for example, that you ban or change Reddit's algorithm. How much of misogyny will that address in society? Or similarly, how are you going to force millions of people to think of women differently and act in different ways to influence the algorithm in a world where there are many powerful industries, including the film industry, that depend on some of those attitudes. Now, this creates a practical problem for society. Uh, you know, if we can't theorize or predict uh, pinpoint causes, what can we actually do about it? But it also creates an opportunity for uh, responsible actors to deflect that responsibility. Uh, for example, uh, Facebook representative Nick Clegg last year argued that the company has less power to influence what happens online than we think. And so Facebook shouldn't be held quite so responsible for these things. And in a post about feedback, uh, Clegg suggests that since Facebook's algorithms are kind of held hostage to the actions of Facebook users, what we really need is less algorithmic accountability, or maybe not quite so much as we're calling for, but actually more surveillance and regulation of human behavior to protect algorithms from the public. And that's one reason the company invests hundreds of millions of dollars a year in surveilling and intervening with content moderation interventions in people's lives. So in today's talk, I'm gonna ask this question, how can we govern human algorithm behavior, especially if we care about social justice? And this is gonna require us to think carefully about what we mean by knowledge and who gets to create it and, and ultimately who it serves.
And these are questions that we often ask at the Citizens and Technology Lab, the lab I lead at Cornell. We work alongside the public towards a vision where digital power is both guided by evidence and accountable to the public. And, and today, as we think about human and algorithm behavior, I want to invite you into that vision, uh, especially uh, to, to think about ways that you can create knowledge that can make a difference. I also want to acknowledge Lucas Wright, who is a thought partner and co-author of some of the theoretical work I'm presenting today. So today I'll be asking, what is human algorithm feedback? What knowledge do we need to govern? And how do we create that knowledge? Now, I especially want to focus on ways that these feedback patterns uh, matter to social justice. Now, conversations about social justice and algorithms often focus, importantly, on questions of bias and accuracy. Now, bias happens when an algorithm, maybe it's for facial recognition, court sentencing, or credit scoring, tends to mistake or wrongly penalize a group of people on average. And it's a useful concept for evaluating judgments that are designed to be partial or independent. And on, on the other hand, many algorithms are designed not to make impartial decisions, but actually to react and adapt to the world around them. Uh, these are personalized algorithms like Google search or chat algorithms or systems that learn through trial and error or aggregators like news feeds that really function like mirrors rather than impartial judges. And these systems aren't really designed to function in a way that can be easily or straightforwardly tested for bias because they're not making decisions they're not making judgments bias reduction is important uh, and it's one part of a larger vision of uh, thinking about algorithms and justice but also these adaptive systems have an important role as well and we need to look at them too you know, bias reduction, you know, uh, you know, for example, we could imagine trying to make the Reddit ranking system less biased towards women. Um, but society might not be better off if Reddit equally amplified stolen implement, intimate pictures of famous men, right? Or if Chicago also had an algorithm that led to over-policing in predominantly white neighborhoods, right? So as we think about these questions, we can think beyond bias. And we should also be imagining a positive vision of the just society we want, something that uh, the scholar uh, Sasha Costanza Chalk has written beautifully about in uh, the book Design Justice. So I do want to say a little bit about what I mean by social justice. Uh, you know, in a uh, persistently unequal society that's built, as we've heard, with stolen land, stolen labor, stolen opportunity, it involves economic justice but also criminal and border justice uh, in, a, in a system that's made African-Americans second-class citizens in their own country, and it's created an underclass from the undocumented Americans who power our economy. Uh, social justice includes health equity, addressing a history of mistreatment and under provision of health resources to marginalized communities. And also a positive vision of social justice includes the institutions of democracy and collective social power. You know, that includes the right to vote uh, in a country where power holders have continually suppressed voting rights. And even beyond voting, collective behavior, of course, it arises from how people think and act, uh, which is why epistemic justice, what people know and believe about themselves and others, is also a building block of social justice. And uh, adaptive algorithms are involved in all of these areas uh, today. So before I share a little bit more about those patterns and contexts, I, I want to say a little bit more about this human algorithm feedback cycle and how it works. Consider the story of Jennifer Lawrence and Reddit. Right? When her illegally stolen images were shared on the platform, individual users were looking at them through Reddit's interface, seeing that they were popular, and then upvoting and sharing them with others. Uh, this culture of misogyny might have emerged whether or not there was an algorithm, just from people seeing and encouraging each other's behaviors, aided by a user interface that reinforces collective action. But on top of that, uh, Reddit's ranking algorithm was observing this behavior, making it even more prominent, and, and pouring fuel onto an already active fire. So when we, when we think about um, 
the mechanisms of what's happening in this cycle, it's helpful to think about individual uh, psychology, collective behavior, uh, user, user interface design, and then of course, algorithm design as well. And let's think about a few uh, feedback cycles uh, because it's not just this case of herding that I've described so far, uh, but herding is one of the, the examples that people often talk about. Uh, for example, when Black Lives Matter activists build a movement through local organizing and hashtags, their message was amplified in part by what are called aggregator algorithms. Uh, these are algorithms that amplify herding behavior by informing and encouraging people to do something that's already popular. Now, even before software, adaptive systems like the billboard charts for music encouraged people to flock to popular songs. But herding, of course, can be a risk for marginalized groups, as we've seen with Chicago's predictive policing system and aggregators that encourage harassment mobs. But it's not just hurting. Uh, it's not just that things escalate. Sometimes algorithms suppress. Advertising markets sometimes learn to even violate employment law by showing fewer job and housing opportunities to women and people of color, as shown in this just astonishing paper by Data in, in 2013. If a history of exclusion drives people away from certain opportunities or drives advertisers away from thinking that people uh, you know, might be interested in something, an algorithm could learn to hide that opportunity altogether. Uh, now, of course, algorithm suppression could also be a tool in service of social justice, such as when it's being used as it is today to reduce the spread of misinformation that is designed to dissuade, for example, people of color from voting or uh, taking up vaccines. That's another example of algorithmic suppression. Clustering is another pattern. When people who've never met each other visit similar websites or act in similar ways online, algorithms can start to treat them as groups and put them in touch, connecting them with vital advice and opportunities, uh, such as sites like Patients Like Me, where people with common medical conditions can, can meet each other and come together to advocate for health equity. Uh, uh, but clustering can also be dangerous when people who, uh, have interests that are hateful and violent and algorithms group them in ways that can actually broaden hate groups. And, and Facebook has made various promises to stop recommending political groups because of how powerful their algorithms were in increasing recruitment to hate groups. Now, people often talk about this dividing pattern. Uh, you know, this power to influence group dynamics has long been a basic tool for political organizing, whether you're building power within marginalized groups developing coalitions for change. Uh, but there's this concern about algorithmic polarization, where groups might become more and more socially separated, perhaps more opposed to each other, and less understanding of each other as humans. Uh, this has actually been much harder to study than to, to like claim, uh, because polarization and racial resentment in the US predate algorithms, and they're maintained by powerful forces uh, in, in politics, in the media, that benefit from conflict and, and hatred, whether or not algorithms are part of the story, but it's a major area of research for a lot of political scientists. And then finally, when market management algorithms uh, adapt to the competing preferences of multiple groups at once, you might have customers, workers, platform owners, uh, with an algorithm that's trying to optimize uh, for all of their interests, uh, these systems can further entrench discrimination. Uh, for example, charging higher fares to people who live in non-white neighborhoods, or in the case of Airbnb, uh, leading to pricing discrimination on those platforms. But it's also important to note, as a number of scholars have started to argue this in recent years, that uh, optimization can also be used for social justice uh, through notions like algorithmic reparations, actually steering prejudiced societies towards economic justice despite themselves. So at least that's the, the theory and the hope uh, for this idea of algorithmic reparations. So we, of course, won't have a chance to go through all of these in detail, but I wanted to map out the landscape for you a little bit, especially because the popular conversations about these patterns uh, tends to focus maybe just on hurting or just on polarization, or maybe just on discrimination, when there's actually a, a whole suite of patterns and each of them has different 
algorithm designs that are involved and different kinds of social processes that they engage in. So I, I hope this gives you a sense of, of why this is important and also why it's important to have knowledge to govern these patterns. Like you need to be able to recognize them and do something about them uh, in order to advance uh, justice in some way. But what, what kind of knowledge do we actually need to do that? Uh, this is a picture from Robert Boyle's new experiments from 1606, which established the norm that scientists seek repeatable knowledge, developing testable hypotheses that are validated through reproduction, through demonstration. And, and this kind of general, generalizable knowledge, if it could be obtained, would be extremely valuable to society, right? If we could describe, predict, and maybe even intervene before or while uh, these patterns are occurring, we might be able to govern our complex world more effectively. But maybe algorithm behavior isn't a science, right? These algorithms are contingent on changing surroundings. They react to human behavior. Uh, once you put them into what you know, William James called the rich thicket of reality, right? And, and maybe when you put them into the world, it's hard to predict what they do, right? That view that Nick Clegg said, you know, we need to protect our algorithms from humans because we can't fully predict what they're going to do. In this view, even though algorithms are very precisely defined by their creators, the world is unpredictable. And it's unlikely that we can derive general knowledge about how they behave. And as a result, we might not be able to devise general policies to govern them. That, that would be a problem. Uh, but maybe that's a good thing, right? Uh, recently, Sendhil Molinathan has argued that if algorithm behavior is more easily changed than human behavior, uh, you know, he's claimed that biased algorithms are easier to fix than biased people, uh, you might spend a decade trying to resolve a discrimination problem in human institution, but you can reprogram a computer, maybe to stop engaging in discrimination. And then the moment you change the algorithm, past knowledge about its performance becomes obsolete and you have a fresh start on getting things right. And that's a kind of a recent uh, and, and exciting era of computer science. And it, it, it's in line with this tradition and this debate in computer science itself that actually strongly rejects the idea that computer science is a scientific field. Uh, to quote Hornbeck and colleagues, computer scientists often think that if you can get something to work once, then you've succeeded, you know, rather than necessarily having to replicate knowledge and create this generalizable scientific understanding, there's a culture that values novelty because computers are so easy to change, they're so malleable. Um, now this disinterest for replication, we should also acknowledge, while it's far from universal, is also very compatible with a culture that strongly values secrecy. Uh, many computer scientists or tech companies, uh, they might want to publish research without having to release the underlying source code or other essential resources for replication, transparency, and accountability. So it might be good for society that we can change the algorithms, but also there's a culture that resists making those systems available for audit and accountability. Now, what kind of knowledge would we actually need for governance in a world where science wasn't viable, right? Where we couldn't predict or prevent things uh, in a very reliable way. Now, I want you to take a look at this. This is one of my favorite machines of all time. And uh, uh, if we were in a room, I, I'd ask people to make guesses about what it does, but just take a moment, like, what is this thing? Think to yourself. So, so this is a sock testing machine used uh, by Consumer Reports uh, during the Great Depression and the period afterwards in the US. It's a members organization that was founded to do testing, journalism, and advocacy for consumer protection. The sock tester is it's really cool. It applied consistent amounts of friction to lots of socks to find out which ones were the most durable. For those of you who do algorithm accountability and transparency, this was a sock accountability and transparency technology. So it's important to ask ourselves, is, is knowledge about human sock interaction repeatable? Like if I test a random sample of socks on this machine, will I be able to predict the reliability of future socks? Or will I have to test every single sock on the market to give you assurances about sock reliability? 
Now, Consumer Reports was founded because no one had yet derived precise enough generalizable knowledge about SOX. Maybe it exists today, I don't know. Uh, but at that time, when new models of SOX came out, Consumer Reports had to test, if not every SOC, at least the most popular ones on the market. And so even as we ask that question in a kind of uh, joking way about SOX, it helps us think about this question of humans and algorithms. Uh, you know, if it's possible to derive some general principles about human and algorithm decision-making, then algorithm policy might look something like what economists imagine economic policy should look like, right? We derive general principles, we build policies around them, and then we update those policies from time to time as old theories are overturned and new theories arise. But if all prior knowledge is invalidated every single time Facebook or Google or Reddit make a change, then we need to govern algorithms like we govern socks or cars or other created artifacts, right? We need to design tests and standards, somehow get every system tested and do it at a scale that matches the pace of innovation, or as we do with medicines, slow down of innovation so that everything can be tested before it goes out into the market. So what's the answer? I'm actually not sure. And as a scholar, uh, that's something that energizes me. There's a good case to be made for the predictability of human algorithm interaction. Uh, and I'm gonna share an example of a study that I, I hope takes us towards that. You know, algorithms are produced and trained by humans, right? There are organizations that have their own momentum, their policies, their business models. Uh, there's the mathematics, the physics, there's how computer scientists think. Um, and we know a lot about uh, social behavior as social scientists as well. So there are a number of reasons to believe that at least some approximation of generalizable knowledge might be possible. But at the end of the day, maybe powerful alg algorithms are more like socks than science. And we need to prepare, be prepared for that world and that possibility as well. So let's talk about how we can build the equivalence of sock testers or scientific experiments for understanding human algorithm behavior. And to start, I want to take a step back and talk about this question of who is in a good position to do this work. Um, I do a lot of research with online communities, uh, and you are probably aware that hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people around the world already do digital governance. Every time we support a friend online, create rules for our Facebook or WhatsApp group, resolve a dispute, or even try to trick an algorithm into working less badly for our communities. And that's been something that we've seen uh, ever since the very first online social spaces. Uh, this is just one chart of the network of communities on Reddit alone that are governed by volunteers. And these volunteers have a lot of different things we can do. We can interact with other people. We can change the design of our social spaces online. And we can also develop automated software and tweak how algorithms work. Uh, if you're curious about that background work, you can look at some of the studies I've done over the years on this. And also look out for a new paper in Social Media and Society by Cat Lab PhD student Lucas Wright that looks at community-led uh, automated platform uh, moderation. Now, in 2016, I was approached by moderators of the World News Discussion Community on Reddit. It's a community of over 14 million subscribers who organized to share news about parts of the world outside of the US. They use the Reddit platform, but like all subreddits, are independent from the company. And their international team of, at the time, around 70 moderators uh, created their own policies and carried out their own enforcement for many years. And here's a story that someone posted to the community in January 2017, a story about an alleged terror attack. Now, almost everything about these headlines was actually wrong. Uh, the man was a Spanish national. Um, with mental illness, he was not even speaking Arabic, uh, and the World News community receives dozens of posted articles like this every day, and some are so popular that Reddit's algorithms promoted them even more widely to people across the platform. And managing this was taking a lot of work, so community moderators uh, proposed a solution. 
they wondered, can we encourage people to question news from reliably inaccurate sources uh, in a way to you know, help people understand and interpret things that might not be reliable? But they also had some uncertainty. What if their policy idea had an unintended side effect of causing Reddit's algorithm to promote that news even further? And this idea of fact-checking you know, is not a new one. Scholars have studied misinformation by trying to correct it at multiple levels, you know, looking at how people develop and change their beliefs, studying the social structures that along which misinformation spreads, and then, of course, uh, considering the role that algorithms play in spreading and uh, or mitigating the spread of this content. And I'm sure that you have encountered a news recommender probably today. Uh, these are algorithms that observe the behavior of hundreds of millions of people, and they make suggestions for what to read. Uh, you know, there are lists in our mailbox, in, in our email, there on the background of sites like fake Facebook and Twitter, and they're the core product of uh, systems like Reddit, which are all about aggregating the conversations across communities to make this ranking. And so managing misinformation requires more than influencing people. It also in involves influencing algorithms. And you might do that a few ways, right? You could have software engineers write things differently. You might create data standards uh, that could influence indirectly. You could develop training data sets. Uh, but also there's this indirect influence, uh, which comes down to, you know, what if you could influence algorithms by influencing the behavior of the people who algorithms are paying attention to? And that's exactly what we are interested in in this study. To understand why communities might think about that idea, it might be helpful to consider a little bit more about how these aggregators work. You know, as people post articles to, to the internet, uh, other people react, right? We vote on things, we discuss, we downvote, and then all of that information goes into a news aggregator, which makes decisions. Do we promote this article further or do we promote it less? And of course, if it gets promoted further, it gets more interaction from people and enters into that kind of herding pattern that we were talking about earlier. And scholars who try to study these kinds of things take a few different approaches. A uh, computer scientist or HCI researcher might test the effect of algorithm designs on human behavior. Um, or you might, if you're an uh, algorithm designer, you might try to tweak the uh, software code to change the behavior of the algorithm. Um, ethnographers like Masanari can observe how people and algorithms interact. Uh, but in my conversation with the, the world news community, I realized we needed a different kind of knowledge. You know, they wanted to know, right, can we encourage people to question this news without making this an unreliable news trend? So they imagined that, you know, someone posts inaccurate news, maybe they have uh, an encouragement to do fact checking, and perhaps people might actually do that, follow the advice and look things up and comment and have a conversation. But what would happen, they wondered, if the algorithms noticed uh, this behavior and decided that the article was popular, right? Because you have all these people now discussing this unreliable news article. What if it then spread the falsehood to more people? And so what they were asking was something that we didn't really have a name for at the time, but it was this idea about what I'm now calling a, a nudging algorithms, that by intervening to influence human behavior, we might also end up uh, nudging the behavior of the algorithm because human behavior changes, the algorithm notices those changes and adapts its own behavior to the changes in human behavior. So here's how we set out to detect whether this was a real thing or not. Uh, I designed an experiment with the community that would respond whenever someone posted a new uh, tabloid article to the community. And in the control group, the software made no suggestions. In the treatment group, uh, the software encouraged uh, fact checking, right? Help improve this thread by linking to media that verifies or questions the article's claims. And then in a third condition, uh, we encourage people to also consider downvoting the article because Reddit has this voting system that's also expected to be influential. 
And then we observed two kinds of outcomes. You know, we wanted to know, do people actually engage in some kind of fact checking and linking to further evidence? We also wanted to observe the behavior of the algorithm itself. We did that by monitoring the rank position of an article on Reddit's uh, you know, ranking pages. So we looked every few minutes, we downloaded what was the top, what was the bottom, and everything in between. Uh, and we were able to plot these trajectories of articles through the rankings. You'll notice, you know, because of the design of the algorithm, something might start less prominent, it rises in prominence, and then it just becomes older and new articles become prominent. It gets pushed down into the ranking and sent to the, to the bottom. And we had some hypotheses, right? We, first, we hoped that by encouraging fact-checking, people would actually do it. Um, but we were also especially interested in these second-order effects on algorithms, right? Uh, perhaps encouraging fact-checking might increase the rank position of these articles. Uh, and then if we encourage people to downvote, we thought maybe the article would decline more quickly um, over time. So what actually happened? From December 7, 2016 to February 15, 2017, participants made over 35,000 comments in uh, over 1,100 discussions of articles from labeled sources, only a small percentage of the news they discussed. In a typical thread, people would respond to this message with links to other sources and then discuss which ones they trusted the most. And you, know, you can read in the preprint uh, the full methods, but when we adjusted for various things, um, I found that, you know, as expected, encouraging fact checking did increase the percentage of comments that included links. So people did respond by fact checking. And then I fit a series of linear regressions for each of these moments in time to, to estimate, you know, what was the average treatment effect of um, uh, fact checking on, or encouraging fact checking on the rank position of an article. And then in, in the chart, I plotted the results of each model and their confidence intervals, as you can see, adjusted for multiple comparisons. And I actually found that an article that received an encouragement towards fact checking was actually demoted in the rankings by up to 24 rank positions on average compared to the control group, enough to move it off the community's front page. So, you know, the effect from encouraging fact checking for the community. Um, uh, you know, oh, I should note that the effect from encouraging fact checking the voting, we didn't have a discernible effect, though it might just have been smaller and not observable with our sample size. We don't have the evidence to, to say either way here. But this was good news for the community. Encouraging people to fact check influences them to do fact checking and could also reduce the spread of articles from unreliable sources uh, by algorithms as well. So based on this knowledge, the community could make a clear policy decision. And the applicability to science. Um, you know, I, I draw a, a lot of lessons from uh, social psychologist Robert Cialdini. He, he's written about the power of these kinds of field experiments to identify consequential phenomena in the world that further research can investigate in the field and the lab. And this study was able to, to demonstrate that you can influence and nudge algorithm behavior by influencing human behavior. Uh, and we might see these nudges elsewhere, right? If a nudge or some social intervention influences retirement savings, it might influence credit score algorithms. Or if it influences prejudice behavior, it might also influence discrimination by an algorithm that's learning and mirroring the behaviors of prejudiced people. And importantly, this is a study that uh, wasn't just led by scientists, it came out of a practical concern that communities had in their communities. So how can we govern human and machine behavior? You know, it's an urgent question. It's unclear whether human uh, algorithm interaction is a scientific question or engineering question or something in between. But I'm hopeful for the value of some generalizable knowledge um, because there are a lot of algorithms out there and most of them we don't even know about, let alone be able to test like consumer reports test socks. But we do have an urgent need to monitor and intervene when these dynamics go wrong, to steer them in beneficial directions. And it's gonna require a lot of creativity to remake the tools of research and also rethink who sets the agenda for research because we're still learning what questions to ask. Right? My hope is that uh, policies governing human and machine behavior 
eventually will become as boring and trusted as environmental monitoring, like FDA protocols for clinical trials or government standards on car safety. Um, you know, policy pro problems are really solved, but they can be managed. And uh, in the struggle of governance, we can reduce harm and, and improve society one step at a time with the help of effective communities, people who care, and good evidence. So whether you're an advocate or a policymaker, a scientist, an engineer, a community uh, member wanting to understand and investigate the things that affect your lives, I invite you to work for a world where digital power is guided by evidence and is accountable to the public. Um, at CalLab, we've been supporting communities to, to take steps towards making that vision real, and, and so can you. And, and with that in mind, I just want to acknowledge the community partners behind this work, as well as a host of, of Cat Lab staff um, and collaborators who've uh, supported this work. Julia Kamen, Eric Pennington, Max Klein, Mary Mu, uh, Lucas Wright, um, and, uh, and many others. So thank you to all. And I'm really excited to hear from all of you and take the conversation forward in Q&A. Right, fantastic. And thank you for that fascinating uh, presentation. So, all right, let's get the Q&A started. Um, uh, there's a bottom that says Q&A in the, in the lower part of the Zoom. If you guys click there, uh, you can add uh, questions to ask Professor Matias. And yeah, I'll take the first one if that's all right. And I, I was really interested in, in, in obviously the methodology with working with community partners. I was interested in if in, in maybe communities in a reactive way where they're trying to catch up with uh, the algorithms and platforms. And I was wondering if you had uh, perhaps thought of, of also other methods where communities are maybe involved in the algorithms or work with platform policy officials in, in developing this, this ways, ways. Yeah, I think that kind of proactive versus reactive question is really important. And I think there are two. I think there are two sides to that answer. One is yes, there are. Um, there's actually some really uh, great work by people like Shagar and Javert on um, community-designed algorithms for content moderation. And as I said, Lucas Wright has a paper coming out that looks at some of these questions as well. Um, and there's a lot of promise for that. Uh, and and I think. Uh, particularly when um, uh, public agencies, for example, are designing algorithms, we're seeing more of a call for this idea of algorithmic impact assessments, which paradoxically, it sounds, it sounds like an impact assessment is something you do after the disaster, but actually they're a process for consultation to envision potential risks and um, uh, collect uh, requirements for a policy or a, a preventive plan. And Lucas and I have a piece coming out soon on impact assessment for these kinds of human uh, algorithm feedback questions. Um, the norm, though, I think, is for tech companies to put things into the world and then retroactively try to solve the problems that those things create. And that's the that's kind of the typical model in like market capitalist societies. Like if you go back to the history of food history, medicine. In all, in all of those areas, uh, initially, before they were regulated, you would just put out like Coca-Cola, put cocaine in the Coca-Cola. Um, drug companies put opioids in the drugs. Uh, and then once people complained and were, you know, had their lives destroyed, uh, retroactively, regulation came in. Like we've shifted in a number of industries like food testing, drug testing to proactive testing. Um, uh, where you have to prove that your thing is safe before you put it into the world. And I think we're going to see more of that in the algorithms space. The other thing I'd say is that a lot of these problems are not new, right? The problem of, of misogyny online is something that people have been wrestling with for 40 years now. And so the veneer of newness is often a tactic to like silence and set aside the voices and experiences of marginalized communities. Uh, and if you can claim that your technology is new and that it's a new frontier, then you, you 
can at least try to avoid having to um, reckon with all of the experience and foresight that comes from past failures. I think we're seeing a version of that right now in all the Web3 conversation, um, uh, where people are envisioning this kind of whole new set of, and, and also the VR conversation, uh, where, where I think we're at risk of completely repeating the mistakes of the past because of this narrative uh, of newness. It's extremely interesting. Thank you. And we have a question from the chat. Uh, it's for anonymous attendee. It says, uh, most, of the algorithmic most of the algorithmic decisions are made with information or database decision technology. Can you explain if the only difference between that kind of decision process and the evidence-based technology is that there is more human agency involved overseeing the process? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best to, to in, interpret that question. So if I, as I, if I understand it correctly, the question is, you know, what's the difference between algorithmic decision-making and evidence-based policy that I'm advocating for? Aren't they just the same thing, right? You're basing decisions on numbers. And you know, one way of seeing it is that yes, that's, that's the case. Um, but what makes these algorithms unique um, is that they are autonomously uh, acting in the world. So in a evidence-based policy cycle, people are producing evidence. There is a conversation about how to interpret that evidence. And then there is a process of deciding how to implement that evidence and, and there's debate all along the way. But if you are implementing, for example, a recommender algorithm, uh, for example, you're, you're designing a route, routing algorithm for traffic, um, that algorithm is continuously making suggestions and recommendations and updating itself in real time. And it's, it's a much faster process. It can react much more quickly, uh, but also it can kind of run away uh, into harms uh, much more quickly without as much human oversight um, as, for example, when Google Ways in the middle of um, forest fires was sending people into low traffic areas, which also happened to be some of the most dangerous uh, areas of conflagration, uh, which was, of course, the reason why people weren't uh, uh, on those roads. So I'd say the kind of speed and scale um, of those decisions and the reaction to uh, data in the world is one of the things that makes those algorithms, uh, adaptive algorithms especially, unique. Fantastic. Um, there's a question from Val. Do you wanna make a question? Yes, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, Professor Matias. You mentioned that adaptive algorithms provide a mirror to society, which makes bias reduction very important in understanding the relationship between algorithms and social justice. So I'm wondering, how does this really connect at a deeper level to the importance of racial and ethnic representation in media, especially new media? And how does the inequity of underrepresentation of certain racial and ethnic minorities online further impact the adaptive nature of these algorithms and spreading bias into larger public sectors? Thank you so much. Oh, that's a great question. We could have a hours long conversation about this. Uh, you know, this representation is a really important part of the story, especially because one of the areas where adaptive algorithms are so powerful in society today is in like the information we know and the, um, uh, like what we are aware of and how we perceive ourselves and others. And it's important to remember that um, like what we might consider non-algorithmic institutions of knowledge uh, have their own history of injustice. I've been uh, uh, reading, for example, recently um, the book by Dan Hicks on brutish museums which looks at the history of the museum as a technology. Actually, he describes uh, you know, the museum as a, a weapon of colonialization, as a machine with, you know, as, as a powerful a role in minds 
as you know, the machine gun of its time was over bodies and kind of upholding colonialism you know, because people were deciding how uh, those they defined as others would be classified, how they would be perceived, how people would be educated to think about it. And that made it very hard in democracies uh, for people to oppose uh, colonization unless they had put in extraordinary efforts to understand their fellow humans in a different light. And what we have online are, uh, you know, algorithms that are learning from those histories and also learning from the like prejudices of the world around us and representing them back and amplifying them in a mirror form. Uh, here in the US, you have um, uh, Sophia Noble's book, Algorithms of Oppression, which looks, about, looks at that particularly in light of um, racism towards Black Americans. Um, but these are patterns that exist uh, more broadly globally as well. And so um, I think the challenge for us, if we want to live in a world where people have this epistemic justice, this kind of uh, opportunity to be understood as themselves, as they would wish to be understood, and the opportunity to participate fully in, in the privileges and opportunities of the democracy, we need to be very attentive to how algorithms are uh, responding to an already uh, a world of, of, of injustice and inequality and sharing it back and, and retrenching it even further. And that's where I think uh, this idea of algorithmic reparations, which April Williams and a number of co-authors are putting forward, is a very interesting intervention, as well as some of the ideas around um, social influence on algorithms that I've been exploring with CatLab. Great, thank you so much. Hi, Professor Matias. I, I do have a question. Thank you very much first for your uh, very insightful presentation. I'm uh, very curious about uh, the experimental case that you presented on the end of your talk. Um, I was wondering if um, uh, if there is any moderator, sorry in advance I missed this part, uh, but the, if there is any moderator between like the um, the information or the sources that people are consuming in terms of like uh, the original source of the news, then the correction or the fact check of, of fact checking of this information uh, in terms of ideology and polarization. And I was wondering if there is any uh, like second effect in, in, uh, in terms of like how people perceive their ideological position after receiving the correction of their information. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I also was wondering if there is other types of like variables that may be like interfering this uptake of uh, either um, misinformation or uh, the correction of uh, the, the information. Thank you very much. Yeah, that question of um, uh, we might think about uh, communities in conflict, right, where you have different opposing perspectives or conflicting perspectives. And there's this set of questions about legitimacy and how people perceive the legitimacy of fact checks and, and other things. And I know there's been some work by people like um, David Rand and Gordon Pennycook on those like political psychology questions. Here we were focusing on the algorithm. One area that we're starting to do more work on though is uh, looking at these, these questions of contested norms where you have, um, uh, you know, you have very different communities coming into contact. And uh, we've heard anecdotally in some of our, quanti our qualitative research about people um, disbelieving what an algorithm is recommending to them by saying, oh, well, that's just popular because my opponents are really into that and the algorithm is listening to them right now. And so we're, we're interested in understanding uh, these, uh, phenomenon through which people uh, interpret not only the social information about the beliefs of others, but also they infer things about the beliefs of others and the behavior of others through what they see as the behavior of the algorithm. But that's a, that's a like very new line of research that we've literally just started this semester. So I think you hit on a good question. And at least it's one that we're excited to investigate 
further. Thank you. Nathan, um, this has been super provocative. I, I think your idea of algorithmic nudging is extremely provocative and, and generative. I want to nudge you a little bit further um, into it. I mean, there is a nod in this to behavioral economics, right? And uh, cognitive psychology there. So one of the things that we know from the psychology of decision-making is that emotions play a significant role in us humans when we decide, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. Can we make algorithms feel and can those feelings impact decision-making for the better rather than for the worse? I love this question. Uh, and I think there are two, two angles I've seen scholars explore this question of emotion and algorithms. Um, one line, uh, you may be familiar with the work of Rosalind Picard on effective computing, right? And it's this idea that if we can, if we can teach computers not just to understand how people think, but also teach them how to understand how people feel, then uh, perhaps we can uh, program these algorithms towards kind of better, more equitable, or at least more profitable uh, directions. And um, there is a fascinating kind of debate and fight happening among psychologists and computer scientists about the validity of those con constructs. Um, and also the like ethics uh, of that, that unfortunately we don't have time to summarize here. Um, but I think that it's important um, to recognize that, you know, every time we add a new capability to systems, um, while yes, artifacts do have politics, they can be used in incredibly harmful and sometimes very beneficial ways. And so, my my view is often to ask not just well what good could we achieve right if we add a new capability to these algorithms but also to ask what what kinds of institutions and knowledge and power do we need to steer those in beneficial directions and restrain the harms that come along with them and i think that's uh, that's where there's additional line of research um, coming out of computational social sci psychology have been really interesting to me um, uh, from folks like Molly Crockett at Princeton, Jay Van Bavel, and, and, uh, and colleagues, where they are specifically studying um, moral emotions online and the role that algorithms play to amplify moral emotions like outrage uh, and the impact that that can have on our civic and political life. And one of the beautiful things they've done, I really love this, um, They've designed algorithms that can um, classify moral emotions in ways that then allow them to uh, measure and observe how these recommender systems uh, and collective behavior are or are not amplifying uh, those very moral emotions. And so like making these advances in being able to detect and classify as imperfectly as, as we can uh, some of these emotional um, expressions can also be a tool for holding uh, collective behavior and systems accountable and generating the scientific knowledge we need to create good policy. And so uh, I think, you know, there are multiple avenues and it's a really fruitful question that I would love to see more people uh, address. Well, thank you very much. That was a great answer. And with that, we have come to the end of our hour. So I want to thank uh, Nathan for a spectacular presentation, uh, Tomas for, as always, great moderation, and our audience for staying with us to the end. I want to invite everybody to join us uh, next Thursday, uh, where, we, where we will have Lisa Flores uh, from the University of Colorado. Um, we're going to switch from uh, human-computer interaction to rhetoric. Uh, and uh, continue with the diversity of voices that this uh, seminar tries to showcase. And hope everybody has a great rest of your weeks. Thank you so much again, Nathan.